welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we are excited to welcome Thea Harding to the show. Thea is a behavior consultant and rabbit training instructor whose areas of expertise include pair bonding, enrichment, and lower stress handling, and is committed to using techniques that emphasize enrichment, agency, consent, and resilience. Thea lives in New York City with a revolving cast of foster rabbits, each with their own unique behavioral and medical needs. She has lived with rabbits for 20 years and has been deeply involved in rabbit rescue and shelter work for over a decade. Her favorite volunteer activity is facilitating rabbit speed dates, during which a single rabbit is introduced to several other rabbits to see which has the best potential as a partner. If you're having trouble conjuring up what these events look like, just imagine the reality TV show The Bachelor starring bunnies. Once a rabbit is chosen and goes to their new home, Thea guides their new family through the sometimes lengthy bonding process. The pandemic was a turning point for Thea because she finally had the time to take animal behavior classes she had been eyeing for years. Her favorite classes included IAABC's Fundamentals of Animal Learning and Behavior, Christina Spaulding's Class on Stress, and Living and Learning with Animals. Thea jumps at any chance to continue her education and is currently mentoring with Emily Strong in Pet Harmony's Pet Pro program. Thea is an instructor for Tromplo, the online training platform, and teaches a six-week course entitled Empowering Your Rabbit, Modern Training for Rabbits and the Humans Who Love Them. After years of struggling to find resources about rabbits and applied animal behavior, Thea created the course she has always wanted to take and loves helping her students embark on their own learning journey to improve their rabbits' lives. Welcome, Thea. I'm excited to have you with us today. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Shelley. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you here. We have only, mm, I I shouldn't say only, we have not had a lot of people on the show talking about rabbits before. We have had, I know, Emma Almquist on here talking a little bit about bunnies before, but I'm super excited to learn more about rabbits and your work with them. It's not a topic that I know a whole lot about, so I'm definitely excited to learn today. Could you get us started off today by sharing a little bit about your or a little bit of your story with us, how you came to work with animals in general, some of the work that you do now and how you came to work with rabbits? So I wouldn't describe myself as someone who has always loved animals. I just always loved rabbits. I had them growing up. I didn't have more traditional pets like cats or dogs. I just, we had pet rabbits and a small pocket pets. And I just really couldn't stop researching them, wanting to learn more about them. I just loved hanging out with them. I loved living with them. And that sort of bloomed over 10 or 15 years into a career. Hopefully everything is still functioning well here because as Thea just saw, my cat Wednesday walked across (laughs) the computer (laughs) keyboard here. Um, So what do you, do you work now? Prof- you do work professionally with rabbits because you teach the online course through Tromplo and then you do some behavior work with folks and their rabbits as well, correct? Yes, yes. How did you get on the path to work with rabbits professionally besides just loving them? Like I wouldn't have the 
first idea, 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 idea. Start advertising and working with folks training, training rabbits? Um, I have to say, I don't think I did either for a long time. That's been a, a challenge for me because I didn't feel like I had any um, many role models for what a rabbit behavior consultant is and what they do. Um, I think that's, that's changed more recently, but I have been working for a little over 10 years as a dog walker. So I've been in the professional animal world and it's something that's familiar to me. So it's been more of just trying to make that work for rabbits in in a way that is helpful for, pe for people and rabbits and meets their needs. And are there are a lot of folks, are you located in New York? Is that right? I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Specifically. Okay. Yeah. And so do, uh, is there a large rabbit, pet rabbit population there? A lot of people there are looking for help with their rabbits? There really is. I mean, I don't think that we, um, uh, there are a lot of people, I think we tend to be a little bit quiet, um, but there are a lot of really great rabbit folks in New York City. I really enjoy the rabbit community. And what are some of your favorite things to work on with people and their rabbits? Do you work with people on any kind of training needs at all with their rabbits? Or do you specialize in, um, I think you mentioned the, um, the facilitating interactions, much like The Bachelor, uh, between rabbits and uh, hooking them up with, with partners. Are there things like that that you specialize in? Or do you work on all kinds of things with people and their rabbits? I would say I work on all types of things, um, but more professionally, I focus on bonding, um, partly because there's such a great need for it. And it tends to be quite time intensive for everyone and gets very individualized. Could you share with us a little bit about some common challenges that people experience with their rabbits? Sure. I think what we should do first is start with just what it's like to live with a pet rabbit. Rabbits haven't really been house pets until, like, it's only been about 30 years. Um, so they generally live indoors, at least in the U.S. house rabbit movement. They live indoors with people. They're litter box trained. They're spayed and neutered. Um, they live about 8 to 12 years, and they require a lot of specialized veterinary care, which can be very challenging for people. It's one of the most difficult parts. And so people who get uh, really, really into their pet rabbits generally change their home to accommodate their rabbits. So it looks a little funny when you walk in. There's often, you know, the, I, sort of as if the bottom two feet of the apartment are for the rabbits. It's either blocked off and there are toys all over and there and their rugs, um, tunnels. It's uh, I, I love I love living with pet rabbits. And I think that there's something special about that. I didn't know that, that they had only really um, become house pets for about 30 years or mm -hmm. within the last 30 years. That's really interesting. Um, and I also did not know that they only live to be 8 to 12 years old. So I'm learning all kinds of stuff already. What kinds of specialized veterinary care do they require? They are very different from cats and dogs in terms of, for example, their digestion and tend to have run into a lot of problems. They use different medications at different dosages. So you have to find a vet that really specializes in rabbits and has a lot of experience with them. They're very, they're hard to find. Um, and it's not just an exotics vet. It's, it's really even more than that. So we end up traveling, you know, pretty far to get our vet care. And it's really stressful too, because I think we're always worried about rabbits getting sick and then need to get to the vet really quickly, taking care of them at home. Um, it's definitely a source of anxiety for all of us. What kinds of things, so you talked about um, going into people's houses who have rabbits and that the bottom part of their homes, a lot of times they've kind of revamped things for the rabbits. So there are lots of toys and different things for them. What kinds of environments do rabbits, I guess, in general, I'm sure that there are differences among individuals as with anything, but in general, what kinds of environments do rabbits sort of thrive in? What types of enrichment opportunities and um, species typical environments that do they do well in? I, I love that question. Um, so I would say one really, really important part of their environment is their litter box, which generally it's a giant 
litter box with uh, like loads and loads of hay piled inside. And they like to hang out in their litter box and graze. And they do that for several hours a day, not all at one time, like intermittently. Um, And that's a really, really important species, typical behavior. I think it's foraging, chewing is very important for rabbits. It's in terms of nutrition, very, very important, but also just the behavior of uh, eating hay is really important. Um, And then they... um, they also do a lot of chewing in general, so you can give them interesting things to chew. They all have different preferences. Some love things like cardboard. Some love to chew on willow. Some love um, sort of paper, like phone books. And then a lot of them really love baseboards, which it's a problem, or couches. Uh, so we really have to direct them towards uh, our preferred chewing options. That's one challenge we have. What is it like for a person building a relationship with a rabbit? Is that as easy as it is to do with, say, a dog? Or um, are there different, does it depend on the age of the rabbit, I assume, when you get them and all of those kinds of things? It's interesting when you mention that because throughout most of my life I had worked mostly with rabbits. I mean, pet rabbits, and that was a relationship that was very important to me. And um, when I started working with dogs as a dog walker, I was really struck immediately by how different it was um, interacting with a dog and walking with a dog. Um, I would say it is definitely harder to build a relationship with a rabbit. It's, it's, it's just a very different vibe. In fact, I wouldn't even necessarily say that it's harder. It's just very different. Um, I remember a feeling like making eye contact with the dog. And I I find that very, very reinforcing. Um, And just, I felt like we were walking together and doing something together. And I actually felt very understood by the dog. Like the dog understood my intentions, um, at least in comparison with rabbits, who I think the default is that you're a predator um, and they can become very scared of you. Um, And so working with dogs was just, I was like, oh, this is, this is why people love dogs. I really get it. It's there's there's a connection there that um, you can develop with a rabbit, and that I felt with rabbits. But that it takes a lot of work, and perhaps depends a lot on on your temperament and the rabbit's temperament. Um, yeah, there's some rabbits who really love interacting with people, and there's some that um, not so much. Do you think that people who get rabbits, the people who you work with who get rabbits, do you think that they um, understand rabbits when they get them and know what they're in for as far as know that they're going to be revamping their homes for their rabbits? Or um, do you think that sometimes they might be expecting something a little bit different than what they get? So my favorite type of person to work with as an adoption counselor is actually someone who's completely new to rabbits, hadn't anticipated adopting a rabbit, but just sort of stumbled upon them and was really amazed and just understood through research and talking to other rabbit folks that this was this is a really good match for them, and then just get really into it. So someone can go from not knowing anything about rabbits and thinking, oh, they're really cute to like wow, my rabbit is the most important relationship in my life. I'm rearranging my entire home. I'm living with strands of hay all over and it's really annoying, but it's worth it because of this rabbit. Um, those those are my favorite. I, I don't, I think in more often it's people who have done a little bit of research and, and are starting to understand that rabbits are more than just like a, a toy or a disposable pet. Um, and... It, they often attract people who are just like sort of quietly observing animals too. But so there there really is a learning curve when anyone adopts a rabbit. And I think also when you whenever you adopt a new rabbit, because each rabbit is so much of an individual, um, but that's one challenge of having a pet rabbit. The learning curve, especially in terms of medical care, there's so much to learn. And since rabbits hide their symptoms, um, there's a lot. It's a lot of learning and it takes a lot of initiative and... Um, a lot of work. I think having relationships with other rabbit folks is very important in terms of support. Did you say that rabbits tend to hide their symptoms? Did I catch that? Yes. Yeah. And so it really is, 
it is so confusing and frustrating and sometimes maddening that a rabbit can look fine and then within a few hours can become deathly ill and need medical intervention. Um, it's happened to me before and it's, it's so confusing. So you have to get really good about knowing your rabbit's habits and their behavior. Um, something as different as resting in a different location than they usually do, like can tip you off that there's something going on. Um, changes in, in eating, especially, that's the biggest um, thing to look for. But um, I'm, I've just been, I'm continually shocked by, you know, I, I'll take my rabbit to the vet because there's, I have a feeling there's something off or they're just, they're not as enthusiastic about eating hay or something like that. And it turns out they're, they're quite ill. Interesting. It sounds like you need to be really perceptive. Uh, I'm good idea yeah. for anybody who's going to live with mm -hmm. a, another individual of any species, but it sounds like you need to be really in tune with your, with your rabbit friend for sure. Yeah. Um, are there some common challenges that pop up when you're working with people and their rabbits? I know thinking about, um, you saying that rabbits like to chew, I would guess that there are, you mentioned baseboards. I think you even said that maybe <laughs> earlier uh, to give them something else to chew on so they're not getting the baseboards. Or is chewing a common problem that you see with rabbits that people come to you for help with? Or, or what kinds of things do people seek help for their rabbits? Yeah, so there's something we call bunstruction. It's rabbits who just destroy your possessions. Um, so that's a common problem, but that's one that, you know, with some creativity and brainstorming with other rabbit folks, you can usually resolve or get really creative with your space. Um, and some rabbits really love to chew. I think this is a great problem to have because it really means that the rabbit is engaging in species typical behavior. Um, so I get very excited by this problem. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity and possibly even a sign of, of behavioral health. Um, so there's that problem. But the really big problem that I think people face is, so when someone adopts a rabbit, usually they adopt a single rabbit and they discover that they love rabbits and they really want to have the rabbit live the best life possible. And that usually involves adopting a partner for that rabbit. Um, and rabbits are very particular, each rabbit, about who they live with. Um, and so adopting a second rabbit and having the two rabbits gradually become a pair, bonding them is really, it can take a very long time, be very frustrating. Um, you have to make changes to your living area for a while. It it's, can be very stressful. Um, so I would say that is probably the biggest problem that uh, the rabbit folks face, the most complex. Um, and the problem with the least amount of really good information about as well. And the rabbit bonding problems, that, that's something that I've been really interested in for many, many years. And I think that's an issue that really led me down the behavior path. It, it, it definitely is. So about 15 years ago, I had... Um, I adopted, so I adopted a pair of rabbits. They were sisters and they were very, very tightly bonded. It was a beautiful relationship. I could tell that one in particular really benefited from having her sister around, was less nervous, was uh, more comfortable around me with her sister next to her. Uh, when we took them to the vet, her sister would be on the table with her when she was being examined. She just, they would lounge next to each other and groom each other. And I really thought that it was a wonderful relationship and that they both really benefited from having each other. So then um, their names were Mona and Lulu. And then one night um, Mona died. It was one of those really frustrating times when she seemed a little off and it turned out to be very ill. Um, but then I was left with Lulu alone and she wasn't as active. There was, it was not, she wasn't doing well. So I adopted a partner and I, um, it was really hard to, I, I did the whole speed dating thing, which was, it's really exciting. I think, I find speed dating just riveting. Um, so she met, she met a few uh, rabbits and had a very strong opinion about one of them. Uh, she did not want to 
she, she hated this rabbit. Um, so he was eliminated. And then another rabbit, they just stared at each other from across the bonding area. And it was just sort of, they weren't moving. And then the third rabbit, uh, they were kind of hopping around together. And then Bruno, which was the name actually groomed her a little bit. It was very exciting. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so easy. Like it's meant to be, they're, they're like in love. And, and I took them home and I tried to do what I did, what I was supposed to do, which is to have a very short date in neutral territory. Um, and so I put them in the neutral territory um, and it just didn't go well. I don't remember even what I saw, but to me, it looked like they, like Lulu may have been attacking Bruno or just, I, did, I didn't like it. Um, I didn't know what I was seeing. It was very stressful. So I panicked and spoke to the person who was helping me bond them. Um, and she explained to me more about how they have to live side by side in enclosures and then you swap enclosures. Um, and then you know, to do that for a while and then do the, make the dates even shorter. Um, so I did that and it started sort of working. They started getting along a little bit, but there were always these setbacks and it was very, it was, it was really stressful for me. Um, and one thing that was, I, I was so confused about is because I was like, well, rabbits are supposed to be together. They need someone of their own species and they really benefit from it. But why is it so hard? Like what, what's going on? And I didn't know how to understand it. I didn't understand, um, like I didn't even know what to Google when I was asking questions, but I didn't understand how we know what we know about rabbits in general, bonding in particular. Um, and I didn't understand necessarily the advice that was given. A lot of it was conflicting. Um, and I just wanted to know, I wanted to know how we know what we can do. Like, how do I know that I'm doing the best for my rabbit and I really want them to uh, to have the best life possible. And so I was really curious and I just could not find out any information about these questions. Like everyone's like very certain that they know what's best. It's like training any species. The, the opinions are varied and very strong. So I, I found that a little bit intimidating also, but so... Eventually, um, Bruno and Lulu bonded, and it was beautiful, and they had a great relationship. Um, and in retrospect, now, with more experience, I see that their bonding was actually fairly easy, which is <laughs> kind of funny. Um, but so in this, I had all these questions. I didn't, I didn't know. I was just so confused. And I, knew, I was like, there's got to be some way to understand this stuff. And then I heard about this field called um, applied animal behavior. And I had no idea that this field existed. Like I just, I had no idea that people worked with rabbits or animals in general, professionally. I just had no idea. And uh, so I I signed up and I audited a graduate class in the in a, um, applied animal behavior. And I loved it. Like it was like this, this is answering all the questions I had, like how you make decisions, um, what factors do you consider? What does behavioral health look like? Uh, how do you measure it? Um, so it was really exciting for me. Um, it was also totally overwhelming. Like there was so much information. None of it was about rabbits specifically, um, yet everything was about rabbits, which was confusing. Um, and then I started having this vocabulary that was different. I didn't know any other rabbit folks that would talk about opera conditioning or classical conditioning. And there were, I couldn't find any examples of these things at all. And I just, I just, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't apply it. And so I was working with dogs and I understood it with dogs. And there was a lot of, there were a lot of great behavior resources for dogs at the time. Now it's even better, but I didn't, none of it sort of, I didn't, it didn't translate to rabbits at all for me. It sounds like you have a common story with a lot of trainers who I talk to um, who have behavior challenges with their own dogs or uh, rabbits or horses or uh, whatever animal it might be. And that really lights the fire in them to just learn and learn more. So so that sounded really common to me. Um, uh, however, I do think you are the first person on the show to say, I find speed dating just riveting. 
That's my favorite line. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I we joke that there needs to be a TV show. Um, and it's the funny thing is about it is it's not like there's not a lot of action. Like if you just like walk by or casually observed, you just like, oh, those rabbits are sitting each other, but sitting just sitting there. But they're doing so much. It's all very subtle. There's a lot of suspense. There's drama. <laughs> <laughs> like who's going to get chosen and then something will change. And yeah, it's, I love it. Very cool. Okay. So back to what I was saying a second ago, though, about this being a really common story that a lot of trainers and behavior professionals, I think, have or that it's a challenge. You know, they experience challenges with their own animals and that really lights their fire and it gets them off on the path of learning all about animal behavior. Um, it sounds like for you, that path of learning about animal behavior also presented a lot of unique challenges because of the species you were working with. There not being a lot of information out there about rabbits. Um, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit more about those challenges that you experienced at that time and how you worked through them and came to the place where you are now, where you're helping people professionally with their own rabbits. So that journey was difficult and I think a little bit lonely and was much harder than it really should have been. And I think it's, it will be easier for people now to, to come to, you know, go along the same path. Um, so as I mentioned, I took that graduate class and I think in that way, I was really lucky to just start with that um, and then be able to see dog behavior through that lens and human behavior through that lens and compare them and then think about rabbits. Um, but in terms of training specifically, I didn't understand that I was training rabbits. I, I gradually started to, but to me, the most of the information I had about training was about dogs. It did not translate to rabbits um, in terms of the context, in terms of the problems with rabbits, um, like bonding. I was like, what does training have to do with this? Um, and actually, sort of a funny story, I went to a lecture on animal behavior um, many, many years ago. I was super excited. I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to learn all about, I can learn about rabbits. It'll be great. Really want to know about this. I was still very new. And um, it was about, it turned out about applied behavior analysis. And I hated it. I was so disappointed and I was really crushed. I thought it was really dry and formulaic um, and sort of weirdly obvious. Like, well, it's like, of course that's what's happening. Um, but the, the person doing the lecture did mention this person called um, Susan Friedman. So I looked her up and I was reading her stuff and I was like, this is pretty cool. Like I, I only understood a little bit of it, but what I understood I really liked. So it was great that I got that early because that that's how I started. I didn't, I started with sort of Susan Friedman and, and the humane hierarchy and understanding that a little bit and slowly grew to understand it more and more. Um, so I was very fortunate for that, even though in other ways it was very difficult. Um, one of the hardest things though about learning about ABA and rabbits is that there are no rabbit examples. So like examples of negative reinforcement for rabbits. I was like, well, what's an example of that? And uh, punishment, I, I still really don't see people punishing their rabbits. I couldn't think of anything about that. And all the, of course, all the discussion about dominance, um, I, I rabbit folks don't have a lot of that uh, background. Fortunately, that's not uh, an issue, a problem that I've generally had. People don't have beliefs about dominance or look at rabbit behavior that I don't think anyone expects their rabbits to be obedient. Um, yeah, it's a very different set of challenges. We're not walking our rabbits. Um, and I think in general, it was very hard for me to see rabbits behavior as, as a problem. I thought it was just sort of a natural thing. Like, oh, they will be fighting with each other be if, you know, when they first meet, because as I understood it and was told they were very territorial. And I didn't understand what that meant. And I still don't understand what that means. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't realize there were some things uh, how I could influence behavior. So well, I slowly started to. 
What a great um, entry into uh, the, the, I guess, the great entry point on your journey into becoming a professional rabbit trainer to, to stumble across Dr. Friedman right at the beginning. I know that you mentioned that, I think you mentioned anyway, that it was a little lonely starting out because um, there just weren't a whole lot of other rabbit folks or things didn't really apply to them. But I would mm -hmm. hope that when you stumbled across Dr. Friedman and her work, you were able to make some connections with some other folks who either were working with rabbits or were working with other species that maybe weren't quite as um, popular or well-known or often worked with as some of the other ones. Were you able to, you took her course, right? Living and learning with yeah. the animals, is that yeah. right? Were you able to make any connections with others at that time? Oh, I'd say the past few years, definitely, um, which has been great. I, in many ways, I've, I've always felt very connected with rabbit people, um, you, because we share the same challenges, like we're, it's very much my community. And so I didn't feel alone in terms of rabbits, um, but in terms of applying apply, you know, applied animal behavior in rabbits and through that lens or lenses, I felt very lonely. Um, and it was like two different worlds. It was like the rabbit rescue folks and then the trainers and the behavior consultants. And those two groups did not meet for me until very recently. Um, so, and I used two different types of language in, in, in each group. Um, yeah, it, so that, that it was, I, it felt awkward to me. And I was also very sort of, I think I was very shy in asking questions, I think in the, in the larger rabbit community. So the nationwide community. Um, like I, and I, it, when I would, I, I wouldn't get, I don't, uh, I guess I felt that, um, I didn't feel like there were other rabbit folks asking how we know what we know. How do we make recommendations? Um, how do we know we're not harming rabbits? And so that, that was a little lonely too. And it was like, why am I the only person asking these questions? Like, and I, I must not have been, there must've been other people but I, I didn't know them at the time. But you do now. Yes, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And I will say, I always found anyone in animal training, dog training, any of any species, really welcoming and really excited to be talking about rabbits, which was great. Like, it was just, I could go to, like, an in-person meeting or I could be an online forum in a class, and I, I would just say, oh, I, I work with rabbits. And it was great. We would just start using examples and, and talking about rabbits and, and comparing different scenarios. And it was, um, the, um, ATA is also a great community. Although, although I don't usually talk that much in it, I'm, I read everything. Um, it's just great. It's so welcoming. It's very supportive. Um, very fortunate in that way. I think it really makes sense what you're talking about as far as um, those two separate worlds. You know, you've got the rabbit world and you've got the um, folks who are in the kind of training community and those being different. And I think it makes sense based on all the other stuff that you've been talking about today that, you know, we've really only kept rabbits as pets in the past 30 years. And we do really don't see like, uh, quote unquote, obedience challenges with rabbits and they don't present the same kinds of, um, extreme challenges in our personal day-to-day -day lives, maybe that some of the other animals who we live with do. Mm -hmm. So I could see why it would be a little bit slower for those worlds to start to merge, but it's cool yes. that they're merging now. Um, do you think that rabbit ownership has gone, has increased in recent years? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, I think at this point, sometimes I've had adopters that grew up with rabbits, like house rabbits, and uh, we're used to just having, living with rabbits, like rabbits in, in their space, I don't want to say, you know, really having them integrated into their home life, um, giving them medical care, um, things like that, that I don't think people did many decades ago. Well, very cool. You were gonna, I think you were gonna mention something about maybe a video of Ryan's, did you say? Did you wanna talk about that a little bit? So I really struggled with 
I was reading all these books about uh, dog training and they were great. Like Karen, reading Karen Pryor, um, things like that. And I was totally gung ho about positive reinforcement. I mean, I still am, but, and I totally, I understood it. I was really into uh, clicker training and, but I, I didn't see how it translated to rabbits. I know, I knew that it did, but I was like, but how, like, what do I train first? Uh, it seemed like I could train all these tricks, but I was like, well, which trick do I train? And, and, and why do I choose that trick? And it was very overwhelming for me. I didn't know where to start. Um, and that, that was, that was hard. Um, but so one day I was on the IAABC website and there was a video by, um, by Ryan Cartledge about exotic animal training. And I watched it and it was a major light bulb moment for me, I would say. Um, I saw all these species doing these cool training things and they were doing things like getting a snake to go inside a carrier so that the carrier could be taken to another location. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, that would be really useful. That would solve so many problems with rabbits. Like I was like, oh, wow, that really translates well. And then he was talking about uh, target training and leading the rabbits around and, and being able, leading not the rabbits, any, any other animal around um, without you know, picking them up or using force or doing something that would damage your relationship with them. And I thought, wow, that could be so useful for rabbits. That's really cool. And then of course he talked about stationing too. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And I watched, I watched the video over and over again. Um, and I finally had a place to start. Like I, I, under, I was like, oh, foundation behaviors. And I mean, it's all tricks, but this is different. Like this, I could see it building on something. And I, I immediately saw how, I was like, wow, whoa, this solves so many problems. This is so great. Um, it was very exciting. And then, then I really started training. That, that video was what, it all clicked, we should, I can say. And I, that was a, it was a, it was a moment that was very exciting for me. That's really cool. I'm glad you were able to find that video and that it um, served as a catalyst for you to really jump in there and start exploring training with your rabbits. Um, could you share with us now about a training situation that either you're proud of or that you have found reinforcing, or it could be both too? So I'd like to share one with you that's very recent. I'm still really... Um, really excited about it. It was very simple and easy and it had this huge payoff. Um, I'm still, still thinking about it. Still really excited. So I had this foster rabbit and her name was Biana and I brought her home and she had, had had some medical issues with her teeth and had, I think three surgeries on her mouth. Um, and she wasn't as we sometimes the, she wasn't social. That's a label that we often use with rabbits. And she was not. She wouldn't approach me. If I sat down on the floor with, me, with her, she'd run away. Um, when I walked past, she'd tense up. Um, and that's not that unusual. But with Bianca, it didn't stop. Usually, you know, I, I let them, my foster rabbits, you know, take the lead on all their interactions. And I was doing that. And I was doing all my like typical things with rabbits and it, it, she wasn't relaxing. I didn't see that much improvement. Um, and in particular, let me describe the layout of my apartment. It would make more sense. So basically the rabbit space is my bedroom. And then there's a series of interconnected area rugs that the rabbits go on. Um, a lot of rabbits will not go off rugs because they really need traction. They just won't go off of them. Some don't seem to care. Um, Biana would not step off the rug at all. She was, she wouldn't even, if there was like a one inch gap, she wouldn't hop over it. She was very particular about that. So she'd go run from my bedroom when I opened up the door and then run under the dining room table, which had a rug under it. 
And even to get there, I had to put a, like a hide box for her. She really liked to be under things, um, which is t- very typical of rabbits, but this was just different. And she re- wasn't coming out and she wasn't engaging in that much behavior. Like she was just, she wasn't doing that. I mean, she would forage in her mats. Um, she didn't have any front teeth. So she was a bit limited in her species um, typical behavior in terms of picking things up and certain chewing behaviors. But I, I, what I really wanted was her to go from under the dining room table to that rug, to the living room rug. Um, because the living room, it's, it's where I do the training and there's all sorts of fun stuff for rabbits. Like it's, they really like to be under the coffee table um, and they can hop on the couch and there are corners that they go in. And there's just like, there's a lot of fun stuff. And the rug is like really plush. Um, and most rabbits go right to it. They're like, oh, this is awesome. I really like this area. But she wouldn't She wouldn't go over this sort of bridge of a rug that I put down. And I tried, you know, putting a cover over it. She wouldn't go down. And I tried luring her. And she really liked food. Like she's, she would, she was, she, I could tell she was excited by, you know, little treats. Um, but I couldn't lure. And then I even tried giving you know, treats, reinforcing her, just moving across by giving a treat behind her. Um, and I was, I was just, conf- I was like, Hi, I really want you to go into this other area because we'll be able to do so much more. Your life will be fuller if you can do this. Um, and she just wouldn't do it. And I was frustrated because I really needed to start working with handling with her and getting her used to that. Um, and so one day, um, I, I got a new rug and I, I brought it home. And it was a fairly large rug and I laid it down and then I, I went into the living room, not really thinking, I just put down the rug and I was sitting on the couch. And then from the corner of my eye, I saw Bianca hopping over into the living room and like really tentatively and then rushing back into the dining room and then hopping over again. And I just sat there, I was like, wow, what was it? is it the rug? But she was barely touching that new rug. Um, and it was really beautiful having her in the living room. She started doing these binkies, which are these sort of like, hap- they're like rabbit zoomies. And she was exploring. And over the next few days, I was sitting on the floor with her and she'd run over and start initiating contact with me. And we started training and it was everything I wanted. But I, looking back on it, which I think is really interesting and reinforcing for me is I just made one change. I just put down another rug. Um, And I'm really struck about how that sort of antecedent arrangement really set the stage for this, for improving her life and and her skills and her comfort with me and our relationship. It was just one change. Um, In addition to that, she didn't even use the rug really. It wasn't even, it was just there. And I, there's something about that, having the rug, perhaps because she, she had more space to get away from me and that made her feel more secure. I think there are a lot of reasons why it helped. But I think that's such a great I, example of antecedent arrangement and how it has big payoffs and it can be, it's just way easier. Like it was just so easy. What a great story. And yeah, a great example of just making one small change uh, to end up getting a big change and such a beneficial change for Biana and for you as well. I know it was something that you really wanted. So uh, it makes me happy for both of you. It makes me think of um, something, speaking of Ryan Cartledge again, who you mentioned the video from, I think mm-hmm. earlier, um, it makes me think of something that I used to hear hear him say quite a bit, um, and I'm sure I'll get it wrong, but if you could change just one thing, no matter small how small it could be, would be, what would that one thing be, you know? And mm-hmm. also thinking of that common saying, uh, small hinges swing big doors, uh, just... Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think, I've oh. heard, I think I've heard him say that before too, but I think that that might be wider as well, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure he might get yeah. all the credit for it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but but it's a good one. And that's what your story reminds me of, you know, that sometimes we can just make one small change and get these big beneficial results. So. Yeah. I will say that I, I all rabbits really benefit from rugs. And I think it's one of the most important parts of their setup. 
Um, and it's a change that I almost always recommend, like add more rugs, just give them more space and more hiding places and uh, things like that. It helps all rabbits. But this particular rabbit, this individual benefited so much from it. It was, it really shows, I think, you know, the, the differences in species level and then an individual level and looking at them individually. I don't think it would have had as much of a payoff on a, on a different rabbit. And you said that she already had a whole, or not she, but in the apartment or the house, there are already a whole bunch of rugs, right? That it was something yeah, about yeah. the addition of this one. And the rug didn't have anything covering it. It was totally unsheltered out in the open. It was just so, it's, I, I'm just, wow, still thinking about it. And when, when did that happen? Just a, a couple months ago. That's great. And so she's hanging out in the um, rabbit zen room on the regular now in the living room there. She has actually moved on to a different foster home. Okay. Um, she didn't, she doesn't need as much behavioral support as she used to. Um, very exciting. She's still herself. Like she's still a rabbit. You can't just reach out and pet her, which is totally understandable. And that's fine. Um, still working towards that, but now there's a place to start. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so you do, let's, we're going to, we're getting close to the end of time here, but, um, would you like to share at all about any of the rabbit rescue work that you do? That made me think of that when you said she's moved on to a different foster home. Do you open your home to rabbits to foster them regularly? Do you do provide behavioral support for the rescue? How are you involved with the, um, rescue? So I have a few different roles. One is with speed dating, which I do both for a rescue called Bunnies and Beyond and for my uh, local shelter. It's the animal care centers in Brooklyn. So I also, I answer a lot of behavior questions or if there's a rabbit, it's just if someone's having a problem with a rabbit, it's often bonding or handling, or recently um, there was a little bit of biting or just really chewing on the apartment in a really excessive way. So things like that, that sort of troubleshooting. Very cool. Well, thank you for the work that you do for the bunnies who are in rescue and the people who are in rescue supporting them as well. Thea, thank you for sharing everything that you have shared with us so far today. We are just about at the end of our time now, but before we wrap up, I did want to give you a little bit of a chance to share about um, opportunities that people have to learn from you. I know that you have a course or maybe even multiple courses, but at least one that you teach regularly for Tromplo. Um, if you could maybe share a little bit about that course with us, how folks could sign up for it and when you're going to be offering that. So the Trumplo class um, is, is six weeks. It's online. Um, and you can find out more if you go to Trumplo.com. Um, you can get a description of it. But I sort of think of it as a survey class with a practical element where you can practice training. Um, I also basically it's structured to teach people about something that I call the, a welfare-based frame, framework for rabbit bonding. Um, so it all leads up to that and presenting that as a framework, a very practical framework that people can use if they're giving advice about rabbit behavior or, um, or have their own rabbits that are trying to bond. Um, but it's also each unit is applicable to everyone with rabbits. So even if you aren't especially interested in bonding or at least right now, um, it's, I think, worthwhile to take. And would it be a good course for both rabbit owners and people who are either rabbit trainers or aspiring rabbit trainers to take? I think it's a great class for uh, rabbit owners, for rabbit rescuers, for shelter workers, and also for other behavior consultants. And do you know, um, I'm not in entirely sure when this episode will be released off the top of my head. But do you know when the course is going to be available in the future? Um, so I'm teaching it. The next class will be in December. Perfect. I'm confident this will be released before December. And so hopefully somebody listening will be interested in your course and can hop on over to Tromplo to get signed up for that. 
Great. Thank you. You're welcome. And if somebody wanted to work with you one-on-one, um, an individual, or if a rescue had questions for you, or if somebody listening just wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do that? So they can do two things. They can go to my Instagram, which is Badass Bunny Rescuer. They can also go to my website, which is BadassBunnyRescuer.com. That is a badass name. I like it. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) It is a really good name. Um, Thea, thank you so much for taking your time today to come and share with all of us about the wonderful work that you're doing with rabbits from myself, um, from the ATA community, and on behalf of everybody listening, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. I I just love this podcast and I love learning, getting, uh, having people tell their stories and learning. I learned so much from this podcast. So thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. And I learned so much from you today. So thank you. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.